uh, tonight we want to th think about the idea of inspiration. That inspiration, that thought that suddenly comes to us that we know is going to be extremely good, it's going to reward us, uh, it's going to be of benefit to the people around <coughs> us, and it's going to be a, a benefit for the next generation uh, that, uh, that comes along. <coughs> Inspiration is one of those things which is quite difficult to uh, describe. It comes to us sometimes like uh, a flash of lightning. Uh, something like that man who invented Microsoft, for instance. Uh, he had a thought and he, he worked at it and he got other people to, to help him and all of a sudden uh, he inspired a generation to look at things like this computer. Well, if this side of the room, perhaps I could say, are a little bit like me, know very little bit about computers, but I'm sure there's a lot of people on that side do. But on this side, I can see these people on this side know all about computers uh, and, can, and can work everything out. But those sort of inspirations don't come very often, do they? And that sort of inspiration has never come to me. <coughs> so I've never had a thought or an action or an inspiration that has made me very rich. I don't think God means me to have any money, to be quite honest. Uh, but uh, some people do inspire us, don't they? I pressed the button a bit earlier and came across this man, Martin Luther King who inspired a whole generation of coloured people in America to stand on their feet and to stand up for themselves, get themselves away from, from slavery. Now, I listened to his speech when I put his picture up on the, uh, on the board. It was made back in the 1960s, I think, or perhaps even the 1950s. But I've got a recording of his speech. And every time I listen to it, the, back of, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because he's so powerful in the things that he's saying. He's so powerful in the way he wants the people that he's talking to, to get up on their feet and stand up for themselves. But of course, it didn't do him much good, did it? Because not many years later, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, and, uh, but his, his uh, uh, inspiration carried on. And the whole of the Americas now to some extent, and there are still, are still difficulties. And in many other parts of the world, the coloured people, the black people, have a freedom. And they have a, a right to do what they want with their lives. So here is a man who inspired uh, a whole generation and still inspire, inspires people today. And then there's Winston Churchill, who made that uh, wonderful speech during the... Uh, uh, the Second World War about uh, fight, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the fields, we'll fight them anyway. An inspirational speech. Uh, but to the people who listened to it, it was. But to his fellow uh, politicians, it wasn't very good at all because they thought he'd had too much to drink when he actually made this particular speech. And yet it had a tremendous effect, didn't it, upon the people of this country. This side of the room, have no understanding what I'm talking about now with the speech of Winston Churchill. This side of the room obviously do have uh, some understanding. But then of course inspiration comes in quite a different way. This young man, Andrew Sutton, who was dying from cancer, suddenly started um, uh, a collection for the Teenage Cancer Fund. And it started with nothing. It started as nothing. And yet by the inspiration of this boy who was dying, and he knew he was dying, and he would die, he has collected for the Cancer Trust over £4 million in a very short time. So here was another man, of course, who uh, was inspirational to, to the younger generation on this side of the room who uh, were willing to put money into uh, this uh, collection that he was he was trying to uh, trying to make. But what I just want to think about uh, for a few moments is what is uh, uh, illustrated by these coloured rings upon uh, the screen. Uh, we, well, this side of the room will probably know more about it than that side of the room. Uh, it is the symbol of the Olympic movement. 
Uh, the Olympic movement, of course, is, is a very serious and a very powerful movement in the world. And it generates millions and millions of pounds. Uh, but it also takes off the people who are staging it. Millions and millions of pounds. So in the end, there is the balance. But the Olympic Committee, together with the BBC, have started a campaign where they want sport to uh, inspire the next generation, the young people uh, who uh, saw the inspirational effects of those sportsmen uh, on the screen or in the, uh, in the uh, Olympic village. And of course, sport can inspire us to do things wonderful things but sport only lasts for a certain length of years uh, in our uh, lifetimes I'm sure people on this side of the room and I keep referring to these people on this side of the room I'm sure that in their youth they were very keen on sport well there's one that wasn't but nevertheless you must have been keen on something that inspired you to, uh, uh, to do something but sport generally, on this side of the room, perhaps uh, is something that might uh, inspire them. So the idea of the Olympic Games uh, is to uh, inspire the next generation of people to take up sport. And if the younger generation take up sport, the idea is that they won't get up to anything else. Sport will uh, consume them and overtake them. So it will keep them off the streets where they are uh, doing all sorts of things that they shouldn't do. Uh, but they will be concentrating and, and uh, disciplining their, their bodies uh, and training themselves to be, uh, to be sportsmen. Now the Olympic Games of course started many years ago. Uh, it, it started in ancient Greece. Uh, and the history of the Olympic Games, we won't spend too much time on this, but uh, featured in, in the stadium races with sprints and races over numerous distances, javelin, discus and many field games. And it goes back as far as 77 BC, that's 776 years before Christ. Now I've tried to work out and always forgotten when I've done it. Which of the Bible prophets were prophesying in 776 BC? That's the test question for the end of the talk. Okay, 77 BC, so it's been going an awful long time, hasn't it? And the first modern games uh, were held in 1896, and these included a marathon, because they were Greek games, a marathon was the town from which they uh, held the Games. The London Games were held in 1908. The marathon distance was extended uh, and so that it finished in front of the Royal Box and the distance, 25 miles, it uh, extended to 26.2 miles is the uh, distance of the marathon today. And, uh, Women have been allowed to compete in their athletics since 1928 and they weren't uh, in, uh, uh, allowed to do that before. Now the Olympics has this uh, uh, motto, we've seen the rings but the rings uh, are uh, fulfilling what is their uh, anthem really, Citius, Altius, Fortius, now that's Latin. I found that out, that's Latin. I can't speak Latin, but the words are there for me to read. And they mean something, Citius, Altius, Fortius. Faster, higher, stronger. And the co competition uh, requires the athletes to run faster, to throw further, and to jump higher, and to leap longer than their rivals. Now, the London Games held a couple of years ago, there were 10,950 athletes competing in approximately 300 events uh, and athletics is the largest, always has been, the largest single sport. There were 180,000 spectators a day from over 214 
countries. Now this is the generation that uh, the, uh, the Olympic Committee and the BBC wanted to uh, inspire. The idea is set was to get them away from their computers and their games that they play in the dark, in their bedrooms or wherever, to get out into the fresh air to compete in some games. Those are the people, uh, those were the people as well, the, the, the handicapped uh, and the uh, uh, dis uh, disabled people were allowed to compete. And the staggering amount of money that the uh, Olympic Games in London cost us, um, I say it cost us, everybody who pays tax, cost us 90 <coughs> billion pounds. Now that's an awful amount of money, isn't it? 90 billion pounds. How many hospitals could we have uh, uh, built for that? Uh, incredible. And did that inspire the young people? Well, no, it didn't. Because the government had just announced that they are going to put another £9 billion pounds into the junior and infant school to inspire uh, the next generation. This young lady was the face of the London Games, Janet Karenis. There she is running faster than the competitors. The Sitius, the fastest, the rowers who uh, won their competition. The longest jump. <coughs> The handicapped people had uh, no problem. And I can remember City watching these people uh, with my mouth open really at the feats of what they were, were able to do with only one leg or one arm or no arms at all and only one leg. Incredible feats of, uh, uh, of, uh, of sport. Fortius, the strongest, the man who could lift uh, the most weights. Altius, the highest, the one who could uh, uh, jump the highest. And what was it to achieve? It was to achieve the gold medal. The prize was winning a gold medal. Silver medal did, didn't count as anything. A bronze medal, well they didn't even care to, uh, to have a bronze medal. Medal, and many of them, if they won a silver medal, medal or a bronze medal, actually threw them away. They only wanted this gold medal, the gold medal of the London Olympic Games. The definition of being inspired in the Chambers English 25th century dictionary is to breathe. Uh, to draw or inhale into the lungs, to infuse as if by breathing, to infuse into the mind, to instruct by divine influence, to instruct or affect with a superior influence. Instruction, uh, dictation, stimulation, genius or idea or passion. And it's that idea and passion, breathing in and living their passion and their passion was of course to win whatever sport uh, they were uh, engaged in. <coughs> uh, we, we talked about the uh, inspired thought didn't we, uh, that, uh, that many people have had. But of course the Bible talks about inspiration. Uh, I will just have a quick look at that in, the, in a minute but just think of what, what are the qualities of a successful athlete well total commitment and whilst we go through these just think about what it has taken you to be a Christian to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and see if any of these the list of things here applies to you as a, as, as a Christian or as the young people here uh, are striving to be Christians in, in a world that really has no interest in, uh, in that sort of uh, commitment. Uh. Oh, 
Okay. I thought you had such a wonderful system. Uh, I did. Total commitment, complete focus on the goal that we have in mind, clearing of the mind from every other uh, thought or action, leaving behind family and friends, motivation, discipline, and a very important one, listen to the coach. The qualities of a successful athlete. Now all of those of course give us some sort of inspiration but as a Christian community believing in the Bible we believe that the greatest inspiration of all is the Bible. It said that success in this life and many people have had success in this life and they know that to be successful in, successful in this life does require perspiration, hard work, long hours. Uh, success in life requires uh, is said to be 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration but with the Bible we believe that's the other way around we believe that with the Bible there is 100% inspiration now just out of interest look at the Bible definition of inspiration Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible is probably the greatest authority uh, of words in the Bible, Hebrew and Greek words. And it means divinely breathed in, given by inspiration of God. It's not very different to the Chambers uh, dictionary, is it? But the focus and the emphasis is upon divinely breathed in and given by inspiration of God. It's a good job I've got my pictures on here. Yeah. <laughs> so what we believe is that the Bible 100% uh, inspiration is inspired and infallible. <coughs> God breathed in. And I want to look now at a couple of passages, a few passages. First of all, to the end of our Bible, to the second of Peter, chapter 1 and verse 21. Second book of Peter, if you could find Hebrews, it's a couple of books after that. Second of Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. Well, let's start at verse 17, because this is Peter's description of how he was converted to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thoughts that he had that were going through his mind now, some 40 or 50 years after his last experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, verse 16, for connection. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So here's Peter saying he actually saw what the Lord Jesus Christ was able to do. Those wonderful miracles that he was able to perform, those words that inspired Peter to become a, an apostle. Uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ for he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased verse 19 we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that we take heed unto a light that shineth in a dark place 
until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is by any private interpretation. Now we've got 66 books in the Bible, all written at different times, over a period of 1,500 years, all telling the same story. And not one of those books were written because the man thought, they, thought he'd write a good story. All these people were moved by the Spirit of God to write down what they wrote. So knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or inspired by the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the scripture, we look at something quite different. There are other great books, of course, in the world today, in our libraries. The works of Shakespeare, for instance. Some of you may have uh, had to use the works of Shakespeare in your exams when you were at school. Uh, but they are wonderful works. They, uh, they, they uh, express the English language uh, very, very well. But they're not the Bible. The works of Shakespeare were written by who? Shakespeare. None of these uh, prophets in the Bible said, I have written, written down this story. They all say, I was moved by the word of God, or this is the word of God. It's not my word, it's the word of God. So they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Just back a couple of uh, books or so to the book of Timothy. So, uh, Second to Timothy chapter 3 and at verse 16. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to a young man, not much older than any of you here, uh, in, in the room tonight. And he was saying in verse 15, that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now where else can we find a book? that in its uh, uh, content deals with such things as doctrine, especially doctrine of the Bible. All our compatriot uh, Christians uh, go away from talking about doctrine. They want to talk about uh, simple things like uh, the parables of Jesus, important as they are, but that's as far as they want to go. But I want to talk about what God's plan, or what God is telling us through uh, his word. Uh, where in another book would you find the content of reproof in our world today? There is no reproof. There's no reproof for a man who steals, there's no reproof for a man who murders. He just goes to prison, he lives a good life for a number of years, and then he's let out again. And reproof and correction are something that our generation now really doesn't want to know very much about. But what is God saying about the scripture that he's given to us? So what is the purpose of it? Well, the purpose of it is that the man of God may be perfect, or come to maturity in his understanding of what God wants from him thoroughly furnished unto good works. So that when a man understands the Bible, that he becomes mature. We'll never understand all of it, but when we understand something, when we understand what God's plan is with us, and what he's planning for us in the future, then we become mature in his, uh, in his sight. <coughs> I looked for a man in the Old Testament that we could talk about who 
inspired a generation. Oh, back on, we? There we are. And there are so many that we could have talked about. But I thought we'd talk about, just for a couple of minutes, about Moses. And let's have a look at uh, the book of Deuteronomy, which is towards the beginning of the Bible this time, chapter 4 this time. And we want to read a few verses from verse 5. We have to remember that uh, the children of Israel had been brought out of the land of Egypt. They'd been rescued by their God, and their God had brought, him, brought them for 40 years through the wilderness. And during that 40 years, some wonderful things had happened to the children of Israel. They had been able to overcome their enemies, much stronger than them. Their shoes, and the ladies would like this, their shoes never wore out. Well, perhaps they wouldn't like that because they <laughs> couldn't buy another pair. But that's what happened. Their shoes never wore, or the clothes never wore out. And they never went short of food. So you would think that the children of Israel would be very grateful to their God, wouldn't you? I mean, if our God did that for us now, we would be very grateful, wouldn't we? Or would we? Human nature is so uh, subtle. Verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that uh, you should go into the land whither you go to possess it. And now he tells them what he wants them to do. Keep therefore these instructions and these judgments, for this is your wisdom. Now for those of us who know a li just a little bit about the Bible, would say amen to that, because the Bible is full of wisdom. It's full of the uh, commands. Uh, of God. There's a whole law in the Old Testament that the children of Israel were asked to keep. So we could say, yes, this is your wisdom. When you go into the land and the nations that you have to, uh, you have to dwell in, uh, some of the nations you were told that you've got to utterly destroy. And that's a hard thing to understand, isn't it? God says, man, woman, child, they've got to be destroyed. But there were other nations that God said, you've got to dwell amongst them. But when you do dwell amongst them, what I want you to do, I want you to use this wisdom that I have given you wisely. This is your wisdom. Well, not particularly for you. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations that you uh, that hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and an understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Now what is he trying to say to the children of Israel? Yeah. What is he trying to say to us? Because these things were written how many years ago? 4,000 years ago. Are they applicable to us today? What do you say? That wherever you go, whoever you come in contact with, I want you to set the standard. And that's particularly uh, relevant to this side of the, of the room at the moment. Wherever you go, whoever you're mixed with, whether it's a school, college, university, work, retirement, we still have to set the example. Now we always have to stand up and be counted as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if I was to tell you how many times I had failed to do that, and I think everybody in the room would say the same thing. But that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to set the standard. So, look, I have taught you the statutes and ordinances that we've just read, where we say we want you to set the standard. But, of course, when we're discussing anything about the Bible, anything about morals, anything about uh, religion, anything about the Bible, we have to use the Lord Jesus Christ as uh, our uh, standard point. And the call of Jesus... Uh, Christ demands as much discipline as the 
Olympic contestants. And the New Testament has several uh, allusions uh, in, in it likening our life to a, a race in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this conjures up certain images in our head. Uh, in today's heavily competitive environment, we might think of many uh, races, jockeying for position and using every possible trick or advantage uh, to beat his or her competitors. Um, the Apostle Paul, that we've uh, seen some words of already, says that Christians are in a race too, in the same way that an athlete trains, makes sacrifices, and we need to train and sacrifice as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to put as much energy into our training as the athletes do. We like, uh, are like many of those athletes are committing Christians. This statement actually said, well, it, when, I, when I transmitted it to the screen, uh, committed uh, as professional Christians. But really, we're not professional Christians, are we? We are committed uh, Christians. There are enough professional Christians out in the, in the churches today. Uh, and we are supposed to be training to be like the Lord Jesus Christ 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, no matter what our job, what our hobbies or circumstances might be. We must be aiming to constantly improve our lives, aiming for the high standard of the Lord Jesus. In the end, there will be not just one winner, uh, everyone who runs the race and and wins the prize that Christ is going to give to them, will have a prize. And that prize will not be a laurel wreath, as it was in the days of the Apostle Paul, but it will be uh, a crown of everlasting life. 1st Corinthians chapter 9. <coughs> And at verse 24, Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And let every man that striveth for the master, I therefore, says the Apostle Paul, run in a race. Not as uncertain way that I might or I might not win it. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And he's talking there about shadow boxing. Do you Everybody understand what we mean by shadow boxing. We go into the positions of boxing, but we don't hit anybody. Um, but it's a way of keeping a way of keeping fit. But, <clears throat> no, not all that run in a race, all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize. Now, a surprising thing when we come to Hebrews chapter one, which is just a few uh, books on. We have some more information that Paul wants us to know about uh, running in this race. Um, it's in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> Paul is looking at, at this race as a race for life. He says, Wherefore, see, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin with us so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that he set before us. Here the Apostle is looking at that race, that marathon race, which takes a long time. The original contestants in the marathon ran naked. Don't ask me why, but they ran naked. And there's an illusion there 
because they've cast off everything that might get in the way of, of them winning the race. Uh, and uh, uh, the Greek word is uh, gymnos, from which is derived the modern gymnasium and gymnastics. This explains the exhortation to throw off everything that hinders. That is to get rid of all the unnecessary encumbrances in our race, our race for eternal life. And this command to prepare for faster movement is also very similar to the Old Testament and particularly to the Passover, uh, where the command is to gird up, uh, up your loins. So when we're running in a race, we don't put on our collar and tie or our long trousers. We strip down, do we not? to the very necessary things that uh, will, uh, will help us. Uh, so, what are we aiming for? What are we trying to do? Whether it's in athletics or whatever, whether it's in sport or industry, we're aiming for the prize, aren't we? We're aiming for the greatest uh, things that can uh, that can bring us uh, wealth, influence in our world today. But the Bible tells us that a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ seeks for a prize of God. But his or her gold medal is earned through faith. These trials come so that your faith is great, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. May be proved genuine and a result in praise, glory, and honour, both to men if we do it in this world. But the prize that we are aiming for is that prize of glory and honour when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed, when he comes back to set up his kingdom. And this prize, when won, is infinitely, infinitely more precious than any gold medal ever struck. Just in the, uh, of interest, there's the three crowns that we can uh, that we can claim: the race winner's crown, which fades away because it was a laurel wreath in those days. There is a crown of pride that the Bible talks about, which no one in the race of life should ever wear. There's a crown of thorns that only one man wore, and a crown of life which every man can wear, that incorruptible crown, given at Christ's coming. So Jesus is the final arbitrator. arbitrator. Uh, he talks about motivation. Jesus said that uh, no man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And an, and an old Christadelphian who was a ploughman said those sorts of ploughmen are the only people that can truly understand what the apostle is talking about because the ploughman ploughing with horses and plough would actually set his mark across the field and he was eight for it and that's the only way he could keep his furrow straight and uh, Jesus said it's like that while he keeps his eye fixed on the mark uh, up the other side of the field he can plough a straight line but if he looks back for a second, uh, the, uh, he misses the mark and the line grows crooked. And Paul says, writing to the Philippians again, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Commitment. Well, we talked about those qualities, did we not, of the successful athlete. And one of those was that uh, sometimes the athlete has to leave his father and mother and his home and go and train in another country uh, where he has to live alone. So Jesus said, anyone who put, puts his love for father or mother above his love for me does not deserve to be mine. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of them. Neither is the man who refuses to take up his cross and follow my way. So Jesus is give, really giving us something to think about. Uh, it takes a little bit of explaining that particular verse. If anybody is uh, puzzled by it, 
we'll have a talk <coughs> to them afterwards. Uh, but of course there is a warning in the Bible too about too much physical exercise which I have heeded uh, with great enthusiasm but not to do too much of it and uh, Timothy again Paul writes to Timothy said for while bodily training is of some value godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come and this same says the Apostle Paul is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance now over this next summer I expect there will be many many people running the race of life and you will be invited to join in this race of life which is to collect money for uh, various charities uh, for uh, various uh, means but the race for life which will take place all over the world thousands of people joining these races and walks to raise funds to help research into many killer diseases but this can only help a little the Bible offers us a time when all illnesses, when all diseases, when all problems in life, when even pain and death will be done away with. Now isn't that a race to be won? A race to be run and a race to be won. And we have the opportunity that once we open our Bibles and begin to understand it, then the Lord Jesus Christ will slowly but uh, uh, evenly lead us to that crown of life.